May it be said of you that you have been with Jesus. It makes sense with this being the end of the week, I think, to start tonight with the end of Peter's life. We've talked a lot about his life and the transformation that occurred as he was with Jesus. But maybe, we've alluded to it a little bit, but maybe you don't know how it all ended. It ended with Peter in Rome as a church leader, as someone who had great influence in that city amongst Christians, people following after Jesus. And uh, church history tells us it was about 64 AD when a great persecution broke out in the city of Rome. And if you've taken in ancient history class, you know about Nero and the fire and all that kind of stuff. So Peter actually leaves Rome. And, and he's, he's, he's fleeing uh, this persecution when we're told that he has a vision. And it's in this vision that Jesus meets him and tells him to return back to Rome and suffer the fate that awaits him there, which at this point was certain death. And so Peter, in his obedience to the Lord returns to Rome, and maybe you've heard this before, but they went to crucify him, and as they did that, uh, he said that he was unworthy of being crucified in the manner that his Savior was crucified, and he requested, in fact, to be crucified upside down uh, as a sign of his unworthiness in light of Jesus. Now, some of that, I think we can be very confident, actually happened. Some of that, like there's some versions of the legend that say that when Jesus appeared to him, that Jesus told him he was actually going back to Rome to be crucified again. Sometimes the legends of church history, you kind of have to sift through. But the interesting question for me is this. What made Peter turn around? Like as he fled persecution and he realized that if he went back to Rome... He was going to die. What is it that made him turn around? I think that's a fascinating question. But it's also a question that you have to ask yourself. What's going to make you turn around? I, I grew up going to church camp, and I've been to a lot of events like this, and I've worked with students a long time. And I know that at this moment in the week, there are certain things in you that are just brimming with confidence and faith and courage and certainty about who you're going to be from this point forward. But I also know that by about November, a lot of you aren't going to have those feelings anymore. You're not going to be living like you determined to live. I did it myself. Like I, I came to places like this and I got all jacked up about the gospel and living for Jesus but then nothing really changed. I didn't, I didn't really turn around. I just kind of kept being the same kid. So what about you? Listen, one of two things is about to happen when you go home. Number one, the same old, same old. Like you'll look back at this week as a super fun week, super cool. There were some rocks you put in a cage and like a thing on a canvas and whatever. Like, but it won't be much other than that. It just won't. Either the same old, same old is going to happen or something radically new and different is going to happen in your life. And what we're going to talk about tonight is one more account from the life of Peter, actually from the book of Acts, that I think if we can wrap our mind around all that is contained in these couple of chapters, and it's a lot, if we could wrap our minds around all of that, you could leave here so energized and so courageous and so filled with faith, certain that, that you can turn around, certain that Jesus can do a radically new and different thing in your life. So let's get to it. Turn to the, the book of Acts chapter 3, uh, and I want to look at just, not, not both chapters, chapters 3 and 4, but some of those chapters and, and these events of Peter's 
life and ministry that I think inform us as we seek to determine not just how we, we change this week, but how we're going to live the next 51 weeks. Like, these are things that can orchestrate this and then moment that we've been talking about in our life. That you can look back at this week, not just something fun you did with these cool little things or whatever, but you can look back at this and go, I was this, I was this, I was this, and then I went to this thing in Warrensburg and I was never the same again. That, that's what we're about to dig into. All right, so listen up. Acts chapter 3, I want to read starting in verse 1 down through verse 8. And remember that question. What made Peter turn around? What made him go back? And, and what in these stories can orchestrate our end then moment so that we turn around and live for Jesus like we never have before? One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. They named their gates for some reason. I don't know. That gate was called Beautiful. Where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple court. So this guy had a great spot. People going in and out of the temple to worship, pray, whatever. Uh, he would get money from them. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for... What did he ask them for? Money. Some of you ain't got your Bibles open. He asked for money. Okay? Peter looked straight at him. I love that. I love that. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, apparently he didn't look back, then Peter said, look at us, exclamation mark. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. He didn't have a clue what he's about to get. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He'd been lame from birth. Instantly they became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I wonder if one of the reasons Peter turned around is because he had seen Jesus heal so much brokenness. Have you seen Jesus heal brokenness in your own life, in the life of your family? Maybe even this week you have seen Jesus heal brokenness in the life of your own youth group. Jesus heals brokenness. And maybe that's what can motivate us to really let this be an and then moment to begin to repeat what we've seen in the life of Jesus in our own lives and live with that kind of power. It's so interesting to me that the beggar asks for one thing, but he's given another. What does he want? He wants money, because he, think, he thinks money will fix everything. He's like, well, I'm lame. I'm beg what am I supposed to do? I, I'll just get money in that way. Like, that was it for him. Like, the best thing that he could imagine happening in his life is that people would give him money so he could buy stuff. Have you ever asked God for something not realizing that what you needed was something completely different? Let's change that from a question. Most of the time, maybe, when we ask God for stuff, I'm not even sure we're asking him for what we really need. See, I think a lot of times what we ask God for are temporary fixes to our brokenness. We're asking him to like patch up pieces of our brokenness so it doesn't hurt quite as bad or whatever. But Jesus heals brokenness. He didn't just heal one of the guy's legs. He didn't just provide for him money so he could have bread that day. The guy got up jumping around. I mean, people looked at it and they were like, isn't that the guy that lays there every day? He's doing CrossFit over there. What's he, like, Jesus heals broken. But sometimes we ask Jesus for stuff that we want and we don't realize it's not what we need. 
you, ne you never like ask God for like a guy or a girl to like you, have you? Because you, you thought that's what you needed. But what you need is for Jesus to be your best friend and your companion. That's what you need. I was talking to a student this week. Man, he's just been AWOL for 18 months. He's been through some tough stuff, don't get me wrong. There's some real brokenness there. But he said to me, so self-aware, he said to me, I've just been trying all this other stuff just to, just to feel better, and it's not working. You ever try that? Maybe you ask God for position, the captain of whatever, the president of whatever, the whatever. But what you need is for him to teach you some humility. Like, that position isn't where you get your value. That your relationship with him is where you get your value. You ask God for success, but maybe what you need is to ask him to help you learn what it means to trust him. Maybe success isn't what you need. It's just what you want. And what you really need is to trust him. So many of you before this week, you've sought healing in other ways. You, you came here broken and empty. And listen, Jesus heals brokenness, but he might not heal it the way you ask him to. He might have something bigger, more meaningful, more substantial, more permanent in mind. And there's this old song lyric that says, we'd rather fight him for what we don't really want than to take what he gives and we need. And some of you are fighting Jesus because you think you know what's best for you, and he wants to heal your brokenness, not just patch it up, heal it. Can you imagine being Peter and following Jesus while he was doing his earthly ministry and watching these healings take place, and then for Jesus to resurrect and ascend to heaven and to be walking around, going to the temple, there's a lame guy, you've seen Jesus do this a bajillion times, and the guy's got his hand out for money, and like Peter just goes, he just, re he just repeats what Jesus did. He says, I, I don't have any money to give you, but what, what I do have? In the name of Jesus, get up from there. And the guy did. Jesus heals brokenness. He can heal your brokenness. So one of the things that some of you need to really think about tonight is whether or not you want to get up and really walk. And, and be a walking testimony of his power in your life. For this to really be an and then moment in your life to surrender to Jesus and let him do his thing. Maybe that's why Peter turned around, because he'd seen that time and time again in Jesus. He'd seen it in his own ministry. And so when, when the time came for him to die, he just turned around and, and, he, and he did it because he'd seen Jesus heal brokenness. Maybe that's it. But maybe, maybe that wasn't all. Maybe it was also the message. There's so much in this. I'm sorry we can't read it all. It would be super fun. Acts chapter 4. So they heal this guy, he's walking around, the religious elite get ticked off about it because they realize that things are kind of getting out of control. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The church is exploding. It's incredible. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, others of the high priest family. Same people put Jesus to death. They're meeting. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question him. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, make note of that, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, 
but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands you before you healed. Listen, these are the dudes that put Jesus to death. These are the dudes that were standing there making decisions about Jesus' life as Peter cowered in the courtyard. These are the people who were sort of on the scene when Peter denied Jesus three times and then Jesus shot him a look as the rooster crowed. These are the same people. And Peter's standing there in front of them going, hey, you want to know how that happened? It happened in the name of Jesus who you killed. He's not out to pick a fight or anything. He's a stone that the builders rejected. He's become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Catch this. Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And it goes on, but catch down... In verse 18, they called them in again, commanded them not to speak or teach all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges, another exclamation mark. Kind of a snarky exclamation mark, I think. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. It is so crazy when you think about it, how much Peter and John saw and heard. When you think about them witnessing Jesus' ministry, when you think about all that they saw in the life of the church as people responded to the message, this lame guy gets up, I mean, again and again and again and again and again. Miraculous things happening. The things that they saw Jesus do, the things that they heard Jesus say, all of the healings, all of the revolutionary teaching they're standing there and with all that in mind they're just repeating what he did i mean he got he tried people tried to trick and trap him all the time and jesus just shared the message of the kingdom of god and all peter and john know how to do when they're cornered in this situation by these religious bullies is just preach the gospel hey you may have killed him but he rose from the dead and salvation can only be found in him and he is the truth, like he's the message. You're trying to shut us up, but we can't help but talk about what we've seen and heard. We can't help it. What have you seen and heard? You are exposed to so much information. A billion hours of YouTube are watched per day. There is so much information at your fingertips. So much. And there are so many messages that can distract from the message. But when you leave this place, students, could it be that the and then moment for you is really hanging on the fact that Jesus becomes the message of your life? That all other messages are secondary and it's a distant second. But you just can't help but talk about what you've seen Jesus do in your life in, in the lives of your friends you can't help but preach the message of what Jesus has taught you maybe that's what caused Peter to turn around I don't know maybe it wasn't just that Jesus heals brokenness maybe it wasn't just that that Jesus is the message Maybe it was what he felt. we got to read a little bit more. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. This is right after all this. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Verse 27. 
Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and remove them. No, that's not what they prayed. Do you understand that being a disciple of Jesus isn't about having an absence of threats in your life? Sidebar. When the church decides to stop living in fear about the boogeyman that we call culture or the world or whatever we call the boogeyman and realizes that it is our behavior in light of those threats that will cause the kingdom to advance, not the absence of those threats, the church will regain the power that it has in the book of Acts. It just will. <laughs> Sidebar over. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Don't remove them. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I got to be honest with you, I don't know how to preach this text. I'm just going to tell you what I think I know for sure. That's never happened to me. I've never been in a prayer session where the ground shook. Most of the prayer sessions I've been in, if I'm really honest, I was just kind of like, this is boring. What does it mean to feel the Holy Spirit's, the Holy Spirit's presence in such a way? Could it be that what caused Peter to, to turn around for his whole life to be changed, for him to be willing to face death. Could it be that our and then moment is not about, not exclusively about brokenness healed in our life or a message that was declared or some experiential element or a week of camp, but simply by the fact that we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. What they felt was the, the ground rumbling beneath their feet. And it's interesting to me, this passage, that, that, that we note that this happens in community. They are together. And one of the things that makes stuff like this so awesome is that you're doing this together. You, you don't feel alone as a Christian here. When, when you're singing at the top of your lungs, the people on either side of you are singing right along. They're not mocking you. They're not wondering why you care about church or the Bible. They're not criticizing you for being religious. You're in it together, and there's power in together. So you have to keep together. Because I don't know why, and I'm not saying the Holy Spirit doesn't work privately or individually, but it seems like he works even more powerfully in community. And one of the best things you can take away from this week, one of the, one of the biggest assurances that you can have that you really will experience something radically new in your life from this point forward, this will be an end in moment for you, is don't isolate yourself from your youth group or your church. Don't do it. There's nothing more important. I played all the sports. I did all the things. But I don't want this to sound braggy because it's not. I'm an idiot. But I made my church and my youth group and the gospel a priority in my life. And guess what? I didn't play as much. I sat the bench. And I wasn't, I wasn't LeBron James, okay? Okay. But I was better than some of the guys that played. I sat because I missed basketball camp to go to church camp. That's why I sat the bench. 
And guess what? I don't, don't clap. I'm, that's not why I'm saying it. Why I'm saying it is this. I don't care. And in 20 years, you're not going to care. And you're going you're gonna to need each other to do this, to repeat what Jesus models for you. You need each other. Nothing is more important. So this power comes from community and being together. It comes through prayer. And we're going to do something in a few minutes where, where you're just going to be prayed for. And you need that. And you need to pray. And, and you need to pray honestly. And you need to tell God when you're mad at him. And you need to tell God when you're confused. And you need to tell God the, the truth and not cover stuff up. But, but be sincere and authentic with God. And you need to experience the power of prayer, not just on your own, but also in community. So there's power in community, there's power in prayer, and that power produces boldness. That last verse says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They spoke the word of God boldly. Sometimes I think we think this thing is like weak, like a two-legged stool or something, like the gospel isn't strong enough to stand up on its own but that's not how the bible talks about the gospel i mean in romans chapter one it's called the power of god the same word there is used for dynamite like this is not we're not talking about like a fourth of july sparkler we're talking about something that blows the side off a mountain that's the power of the gospel in romans chapter 10 a little later paul is talking about how when we spread the gospel he says how beautiful are the feet of those that spread the good news and i used to think i don't know i pictured like some sissy angel like running around with girly feet or something and I was like that as I read what that means that's a that's alluding back to Isaiah 52 which is not like some angelic chorus spreading beautiful feet goodness or whatever it's a military term it's like it's like soldiers marching in and affecting change because there's power in the gospel but that power doesn't come from you. I'm an idiot. You're an idiot. We're going to do our best to screw this up almost all the time. We're timid and fearful. We don't want people to make fun of us. We don't want to look weird. We don't always get it. But, but remember what the religious leaders said about Peter and John. They were unschooled. They were ordinary. Man, I am okay with being ordinary. If I can figure out what it means to live in the power of the Holy Spirit and feel the presence of the Spirit in my life so that I can speak boldly the truth of the gospel. Maybe that's what made Peter turn around. Maybe that's what can orchestrate our and then moment. Maybe, maybe that was it, what he felt, that, 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 that Jesus sent that power to him or maybe it was all of it right maybe it was he'd seen Jesus heal brokenness you've seen Jesus heal brokenness he he knew that Jesus was the message you know Jesus is the message maybe it was that Jesus sent that power you know that Jesus can send you that power maybe it was all of it or maybe when you think about it all of it is really just one thing Tina's my friend down in Katy. She's an unschooled and ordinary person. She's worked side jobs, worked in the school district, worked with disabled kids, but she just felt this tug on her life to serve the homeless. And so she started a nonprofit. Our nonprofits kind of collaborate. So I've learned her story. She was working a full time job and doing this on the side. And when I say doing this on the side, I mean, feeding the homeless, giving them rides, helping them get clothes for job interviews, helping them learn how to write a resume, finding churches where they could take showers, feeding them supper, like on the streets, hands dirty, under the bridge, homeless ministry. And they're not clients to her, they're friends. How can you explain this ordinary woman, didn't go to Bible college, worked in a school district, helping over 40 homeless people in the last couple years get off the street. How do you explain that? How do you explain, some of you maybe have heard this story, but this pastor in India 
beaten within an inch of his life, his wife killed by the same attackers. He was in a coma so long he missed his own wife's funeral. How do you explain that same man going back to the same place, to the same people, preaching the gospel boldly and without hindrance, and even baptizing some of the people that killed his wife? How do you explain that? How do you explain a young girl who was abused multiple times by multiple people as a child, whose dad was completely absent, but who was introduced to Jesus in junior high, grew in her faith through high school, was completely transformed by the gospel at a conference just like this one, and has spent the rest of her life seeking to serve people in Jesus' name, despite all the junk and hurt that she has felt through medical care and counseling and leading in the local. How do you explain that stuff? There's only one explanation, and it's found in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, right after, right after the religious bullies were astonished at the fact that these unschooled, ordinary men were in the middle of this movement of the Spirit. And the language that's used is, they took note that they had been with Jesus. Young people, you have been with Jesus. And I don't know what you think about when you think about what's next, if it's a little intimidating for you, if it's a little scary. But may it be said of all of us that we have been with Jesus. May we join Jesus in healing broken things. May we boldly proclaim his message, unable to stay quiet. May the ground, if not literally, at least figuratively, may it quake beneath our feet because of the power of the gospel. We want to give you an opportunity tonight. This is so simple, but it could be such a beautiful, meaningful moment for you to just ask for some help. Because when I sat where you're sitting, I was intimidated by it all. I can't be that bold. I can't heal brokenness. I can't preach that message. I can't feel that power. You know what the best conclusion you could come to tonight is that that's true. You can't. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can repeat the work that Jesus is doing in your life and see it done in the lives of others. And I just, I don't know, there's three ways we want to challenge you to focus in and, and really ask God for some help tonight. Uh, in a moment, these are going to appear all over the room, and, and you're going to choose one. So pay attention to what these represent. The, the blue orb here, it, it represents abiding in Jesus. Some of you, the reason why these camps send you on a huge high, but then by midwinter, you're like, I don't even know what's going on in my life, is because you forget just to abide in Jesus, just to be with Jesus. So when I say, may it be said of you that you have been with Jesus, if being with Jesus is really what causes our and then moment to change everything, then some of you really need to seek help and get prayer for abiding in Jesus. And so in a moment when we, when we do this, th this will be uh, in this room and, and just look for this orb. And there will be adults there that want to pray with you in the power of the Holy Spirit that you can just continue to be with Jesus as you have been this week. Maybe for some of you, you're in a little different place. And when I started talking about being together, you knew that that's something that you needed to concentrate on in the coming year. If this is going to be an and then moment for you, you can't isolate yourself. You can't prioritize other things. You need the people in this room. You need the people in your youth group. You need the people in your church. You need other Christians in your school. You need to be together with people. So maybe you need to pray for some Christians in your school. Maybe you need to pray that you make some tough decisions about how busy you make your life because being around the people of God needs to be a priority for you. Maybe that's what you need, the, the together part, the power that comes in community. And so in a moment when we invite you to pray, look, look for this orb, find it. There will be adults there that would love 
uh, to pray with you and the power of the Holy Spirit for that. But maybe some of you understand that you need to reach out, that repeating Jesus, as you've looked at the life of Peter, you understand that you need to reach. And, and watching those Kingdom Worker videos, it's like you're just convicted. You need to do something outside of your comfort zone. You need to allow Jesus to stretch you. You've been changed by the resurrection. You know the truth of the gospel, but you've been playing it a little safe. In the power of the Holy Spirit tonight, I beg you, maybe it's about your kingdom worker card, or maybe it's about something you don't even know what it's about. You need to just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in your life in such a way that you will reach out and do something that you never thought you would do, that you can't do on your own. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit can you do it. And so in a moment when we invite you to pray, I, I want to ask those of you who are ready to reach to find that area in the room and to receive prayer for that. You're also going to get a little wristband that corresponds with the color you chose as a reminder to you as you leave that this isn't the end, it's the beginning. The beginning is near. The beginning of a life lived for Jesus, the beginning of the rest of your testimony, whoever you were doesn't have to remain because of this and then moment because when you've been with Jesus there is boldness when you've been with the Spirit and live by the Spirit there is power when you have an and then moment nothing is ever the same again I'm gonna pray and as we sing in a moment and you see these distributed around the room I beg of you Ask God where you need the most help, where you need to be tethered to Him, where you need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life in the greatest way, and go and receive prayer, and may God move in your heart, and in this place, and in your communities, and in your schools, because you have been with Jesus. Lord, thank you for the truth of the gospel, for the power of the Spirit. I pray that in the lives of these students that you would move tonight in conviction, in repentance, in commitment, give them courage, give them boldness. May the fact that they've been with you this week change everything. And may the fact that they are with you day by day allow them to repeat the miraculous works through the power of the Spirit that we saw you live out. May their boldness match the boldness of the apostles. May the transformation that we witness match the transformation that we read about in Scripture. Not because we're great, but because we've been with you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.